This session is really going to be giving an overview of the challenges and opportunities in future cities. We're going to be looking at where London is at the moment, economically speaking, what the picture is. We're going to be looking at its global competitiveness um, now and how it might and should and must adapt to the future. So a very big picture session and one that I'm particularly looking forward to. And we have four fantastic speakers. We'll be hearing from the Lord Mayor of London. We'll be hearing from the Mayor's Economic Advisor. Um, we'll be hearing from the woman who brought the Olympics to London and could possibly be our next mayor, who knows, um, and also from the Chairman of Future Cities, Catapult. So really a fantastic array of expertise there and a really exciting session. So to get us started, um, I'm delighted to welcome onto the stage our host for today, uh, Fiona Wolfe is the Lord Mayor of London. Uh, she's the 686th Lord Mayor, but only the second woman. Um, she's in nearly a thousand years. She's also a senior partner at CMS Cameron McKenna. She's advised 28 governments on energy matters, um, and we are most grateful for her today. Please welcome Fiona Wolfe, the Lord Mayor of London. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Guildhall. I've been looking forward to welcoming you for more months than you can imagine, um, ever since uh, Andrew Dowding and Tony Mannering brought the, the prospect of, of, of welcoming you all here uh, to me, which was something um, which was really, I felt, was going to be the absolute highlight of my year. Tomorrow's city and tomorrow's cities are the focus of my mayoralty. Um, I'm very conscious of the weight of tradition uh, that we have in the city of London, given uh, the, the, the way in which the role of the Lord Mayor, ha dating as it does from 1189, um, has changed over time. Um, and we must always work hard to make it modern and relevant. I firmly believe for the city um, and indeed London to remain relevant, uh, competitive and successful, we absolutely cannot be complacent. And I'm sure that the city fathers of our former capitals of England, such as Colchester, Winchester or York, thought that their stars would never set and that they would grow and dominate the world. But People changed, technologies changed, trade moves, moved on, and their status declined. And as an energy lawyer, based in the city of London, but having worked in over 40 countries, infrastructure and finance are subjects very close to my heart, and particularly in the context of sustainable urban development. And this is one of the factors that led to my decision to focus the core theme of my mayoralty on the energy to transform lives. And I've taken the theme both figuratively and literally. The alchemy which creates successful cities is arcane and complex. Cities are more than a collection of buildings and infrastructure systems. Cities are factories of the mind, driving innovation, creating wealth, and providing security and opportunity. A few weeks ago, I hosted an event here and at the Mansion House at which the Prince of Wales, President Bill Clinton, IMF head Christine Lagarde and Governor Mark Carney and countless other global leaders and captains of industry spoke passionately about the need for capitalism to focus on the inclusion of human capital and people who start and grow businesses. Crucially, it was about looking into the future and integrating environmental and social factors into the concept of long-term value creation. This has been a constant drumbeat in the breakfasts, debates, seminars and dinners which have peppered my waking hours, both here in the UK and on my overseas visits. And it has confirmed what I already suspected, an interest in cities, infrastructure, and sustainability is very prevalent and very pragmatic as it is linked to an issue that all cities face dynamic change. 
As world cities expand, housing, sanitation, waste, water, transport, and of course, energy infrastructure will all require substantial investment, an investment that integrates environmental and social and democratic, democra uh, democra I won't say democratic, I mean demographic <laughs> factors <laughs> that makes importantly, must make scarce space and resources go further, and that builds re resilience and especially takes into account the uncertainties of climate change. We know we cannot plan in silos. We can no longer take a decision on waste without taking into account transportation, energy, water, roads, and other things. And cities which do not rise to this challenge will fail. Citizens, of course, are cities' most valuable resource. And failing to invest in infrastructure means failure to invest in our people. That would lead, of course, to social disorder and unrest. However, population growth is not just an issue for booming cities of China, India, or South America. Right here in London, we will face a population rise of 2 million by 2030. But if the scale of the challenge is immense, so too is the scale of the opportunity, particularly in London. And we're blessed to be home to some of the world's top universities, all of which can offer bespoke advice and guidance to help cities create a vision of the future. We boast the innovation, engineering, and architectural talent which can make these visions a reality. We have the financial muscle to pay for the construction of infrastructure and buildings, particularly through our deep capital markets. And we have the legal services to design the contracts. And we have the insurance sector that it can underwrite risk and make sure that resilience is built in. And this is not pie in the sky. London's low carbon and environmental goods and services sector, foundation stones of our offering to cities, has grown year on year from 20.9 billion in 2007-8 to 25.4 billion in 2011-12. The sector contains over 9,200 companies and employs over 163,500 people, some of whom were pre present at the demand-led innovation competition, which took place at the beginning of this month, hosted by the City of London and organized by the Institute of Sustainability and the Better Buildings Partnership. These firms are in the vanguard of British firms seeking to find solutions to the challenges facing tomorrow's city, from smart streetlights to smart grids. Make no mistake, the three titans of scarcity, supply, and demand indicate that this market will be the biggest the world has ever seen. And here in London, in common with a number of other major cities, we also face an acute problem with the capacity of our electrical distribution infrastructure. Our current regulatory regime does not encourage the required strategic investment in the network. And people complain to me about superfast broadband and mobile phone connectivity right here in the city of London. A recent review of London's electricity infrastructure commissioned by the GLA reported that if lack of readily available electricity infrastructure capacity caused only 1% of growth in London's financial sector to locate elsewhere. The result would be a negative impact on London's GVA of nearly £600 million. To this end, I believe that the depoliticization of infrastructure planning would allow the analysis of long-term needs aid decision-making, and reduce policy risk across multiple electoral cycles. Uh, we have seen a piece in the Financial Times this morning with warnings from Michael Heseltine and Andrew Adonis on the decision-making for new airport capacity for London, new capacity we have not added for over 50 years. 
Um, and I'm fond of telling a story about the, the delay in making decisions in relation even just to Terminal 5, which started in 1991, where my firm was instructed on the planning inquiry for that and to do the documentation for, term, for the new Hong Kong airport. Um, within 10 years, the new Hong Kong airport had been operational uh, for three years. Um, they, there was no planning decision even though the planning inquiry had ceased um, some years before, there was still no planning decision on Terminal 5 at Heathrow 10 years later. Many countries actually separate the determination of public interest need from local siting or planning permission, uh, with impacts on the local community and the environment carefully resolved by consensus building and technical review rather than judicial process. But to finish, where should investment funding come from? An outcome from Basel III and the enhanced liquidity requirements has been a reduction in bankers' ability to undertake long-term lending, particularly lending which ties up capital for the traditional project finance model of 15 years or so. To this end, we're seeing new forms of public-private partnerships and infrastructure funds uh, emerging. Um, and we're asking ourselves the question of whether the city's autonomy in raising finance uh, could be increased. Um, should they be and could they be given the ability to raise their own funds through project or infrastructure bonds? Another model I've seen both in Germany and in Brazil is the, the use of the, uh, the, the development bank for the more difficult risks. Um, and we, uh, we have now the, the, the Green Investment Bank um, as an interesting uh, model emerging. But there are plenty of people who are interested in funding infrastructure projects um, and the, they seem to become, be coming from the um, overseas pension funds who are located here from Canada, Australia and America who are active players uh, and taking a long-term view. And there is now a pressure on pension fund trustees generally not to take an overly uh, narrow view of their fiduciary duty and to mandate their asset managers to implement longer term strategies. So there is potential to unlock uh, more pension fund capital. I've probably thrown enough thoughts into the mix for one morning and I hope they will generate further discussion over the course of the day today provides an excellent forum for de debate uh, and how we can seize the immense opportunities and overcome the sizable challenges we face in helping London become both a city of cities and a city for cities. As the mayor of Istanbul said to me, London has a responsibility to other cities and this is a responsibility we must uphold. Thank you very much. Well, well, many thanks to Fiona Wolfe, the Lord Mayor of London. And as she said, she has thrown a lot of ideas um, out towards us all. And I certainly could see from the Twitter feed that um, a lot of what she was saying was being picked up and was going down very well. I think people particularly enjoyed cities are factories of the mind. I saw that being repeated many times, and it is a fantastic phrase. Um, but as, as we said, we are going to be discussing all these issues um, at the end uh, when we've heard our four speakers. Um, and Fiona gave us a lot of food for thought. I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. He's Boris's go-to man on everything to do uh, with the economy, both London's economic forecast and, of course, the wider country, because you can't disassociate the two. Uh, he's Dr. Gerard Lyons, Chief Economic Advisor to the Mayor of London. Um, you will recognise him from many appearances. Uh, lots of us journalists go to him for his valued opinions. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, good morning, it's great honour, great pleasure to be here. Uh, Boris, uh, the Mayor, asked me to send his very best wishes for your conference and hopes it's a great success. I'd like to focus on three areas, global, regional and local. And I think all are very important when discussing London's current and future situation. Globally, London is seen as a global city but I think we have to recognize the challenges that are to be faced in the future. 
and the importance of London continuing to adapt and change to remain a global city. I think it will easily do that. But just to highlight the issues, um, in the next 20 years, it's likely that two-thirds two -thirds of global growth will come from the top 600 cities in the world. If you were to take the top 600 cities in the world now, just under 160 of them are in the West. In 20 years' time, only about 20 of them will be in the West. What you are seeing is the emergence of new cities, cities that are growing strongly across the globe. Many of these cities are able to implement smart technology. They're new cities with new housing, new transport, new infrastructure. The cities that succeed in the future, whether small, medium, or large like London, are those that will have to adapt and change, those that play to their strengths, and very importantly, those that continue to anticipate the future. The great thing is that London has done all of these in the past, and the hope is it does it in the future. Earlier this year, Deloitte, one of the many important consultancies based here in London, did a very interesting analysis saying where are the top key global workers, the mobile workers, located? And it came up with a very interesting conclusion that London leads the way and by a considerable distance in Europe. Globally, the city with the most mobile high-skilled workers was London with 1.5 million. Next was New York with 1.2 million. Then Los Angeles with about 800,000. Then Boston, around 600,000. And Hong Kong, around 500,000. So we clearly are Europe's global city. Interestingly, despite a financial crisis, the financial sector and the city of London has done pretty well in the last five to six years. Quite frankly, we should call it a banking crisis. Banks are being addressed, the issue of banking regulation, etc. But if you take out the banks, obviously you can't, but if you take it out, the banks, and you look at the rest of the city of London, insurance, legal, professional, business, consultancy, and general financial services, they have all done well. But it's important to say that London, whilst it's specialized in one respect with the city being so important, it's also very diversified. Science and the science base continues to grow in London. The tech base continues to grow in London. Creative industries are not always measured properly, but are a key part of the London story. London basically is doing well, but it's also doing very well within Europe. It's not often highlighted how much Europe needs the UK and how much Europe needs London. We always tend to look at the story the other way round. Last year, the European Commission did an analysis of the most competitive regions in Europe. Three of the most competitive, three in the top five, are in the south of England. Surrey and Sussex in fifth place. Buckinghamshire, how often do we talk about Buckinghamshire in these places? Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire and Oxfordshire in third place. And then London also in the top five. So the south of England leverages off and feeds into London. So first part of my story is about the global competition and the need to ensure that London continues to position itself globally. But second part is the regional story. Um, I grew up in Kilburn, actually, and I've always been amused in some respects by the continued focus, almost obsession in the UK with the north-south divide. The reality is that all the challenges you see in the so-called north, you see in London. It's far more complex than saying it's a north-south divide. All the cities of the UK have their good bits. All the cities of the UK, it seems, have their challenges. London is no different. 19, 1.9% of people working in London are on less than the London living wage. Five of the poorest boroughs in the country are in London. The cost of housing and of rent is an issue here like it is in many other cities. So those challenges are very apparent here. The good thing is that London is continuing to make headway on some of the key important issues. Particularly, there's been a major advance in London over the last decade or so on education. Education is one of the big challenges. 
In Britain, we tend to have a two-tier system. The top end is incredibly good. London does very well, as does many other parts of the country, with basically clusters centered around universities. But it's at the bottom end, in terms of basic skills, that the UK needs to do more. More jobs are being created. Admittedly, not all the jobs are the best type of jobs, zero-hour contracts, part-time work. But even allowing for that, there has been a marked improvement. But also, in terms of working with other cities in the UK, it's important to say that London does dominate the UK in the way in which some other cities don't dominate major economies on the continent. Let's put it another way. There are many countries in Europe where the capital city dominates more than London dominates the UK. But when you look at the big countries, in Germany, Berlin is about 4% of the German economy. In France, Paris is less than 10% of the French economy. London is about 24% of the UK economy. One of the good things since I've been working at Boris 18 months ago, one that, apart from doing detail really well, one of the things that Boris is really keen on is strategic thinking along these key issues. Last year, there were two strategic reports prepared at City Hall. One was the 2020 vision about London. I'll come on to that in a second. The other was the Independent London Finance Commission under Tony Travers. It was a cross-party commission. And let me just highlight why it's important to address these issues that the London Finance Commission addressed about financing of cities. Since the late 60s, we have had a litany of reports in Britain about local finance. Britain, it seems to me, analyzes problems better than anyone else, then never seems to read any of the reports. Since the late 60s, the Kilbradden Commission, 69 to 73, Layfield Committee, 74 to 76, Local Government Finance Review, 86 to 93, the Balance of Financing Review, 2003, 2004, all of these are pretty good, I tell you. The Lions Report, nothing to do with me, 2004 to 2007. City Finance Commission, I'm almost finished, by under Lipton, 2011. The Murleys Review under, in 2011, all looking at local finance. Basically, what Boris did last year was to have a cross-party commission, and what's going on now is there's a city-centered campaign uniting Boris, the Lord Mayor, the 32 London boroughs, and also uniting London with the core cities across the UK. Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, Nottingham, and Sheffield. And it's about giving more finance to local cities and local areas to address some of their infrastructure and other needs. And that comes on to the third and final part, which leads into today's uh, conference. The key for London in the future is to continue to create the enabling environment in which business will grow and in which investors, both domestic and international, will want to invest here. Last night, the mayor had his annual London debate. Six years ago, the focus was on issues such as transport and policing and crime. Last night, it was housing. London's trying to create a neighboring environment. Crime has fallen sharply. Transport issues have been addressed. You've got Michelle Dix from Transport for London talking later. She's fantastic. She'll talk about what's happening there. But there is more that needs to be done. Housing. There is a 30 to 40 year legacy issue here. Britain doesn't do long-term very well. As I indicated, we analyze, we identify the problem, then we don't address it. Housing is one of those issues. Not only is there a legacy issue, there's also rapid population growth. London's population is growing 100,000 per year. On top of that, we have strong economic growth in coming, not just now, but likely to see it in coming years. So housing, both affordable and available for everyone, are part of the is part of the story. Power has been mentioned. Also, the environmental issues have been mentioned. Connectivity, and I'll just take another one or two minutes, is very important. Transport within London is being addressed by expanding the tube network, by planning to have more cross-Thames links, connecting the outer boroughs so that not everything comes into the centre. But the airport is a big issue. Lund the UK needs a four-runway hub airport. More cities in the UK now use Amsterdam Airport as their hub than they use Heathrow. The Airport Commission basically puts three options on the table, the inner grain, not the Boris Island, Heathrow or Gatwick. Quite frankly, Gatwick doesn't answer any of the questions. You can't build four runways at Gatwick. The question has to be whether you go for Heathrow 
where it is now, or what I would call Heathrow East in the Isle of Grain. Uh, the mayor has made it clear about the potential, if we go eastward, to really diversify, develop, and expand London to the east, and also create a logistics hub. Last year, a new London port was built with private money, Dubai ports, north of the Thames, 1.5 billion was spent on it. You can have a logistics hub as, hub as well as a transport link. And finally, it's about having a vision. We keep talking about Europe in the UK. In 20 years' time, the UK will have a bigger population than Germany, 20 to 25 years' time. If we make just small inroads to our productivity gap, which I think we are already doing, then the UK will overtake Germany as the biggest economy in Europe. London has a key role to play in that as long as we do the three I's, as long as we continue to invest, innovate, and address our infrastructure. Thank you. Well, Gerard, many, many thanks. Um, and of course, both of our speakers have talked about how politics and politicians can really hold up um, any movement on these big infrastructure issues and how often politicians are seen as the problem, the roadblock. Um, so fascinating to hear the views of our next speaker with that in mind. Dame Tessa Jowell um, is an MP. She's been an MP since 1992. Of course, she's sat in Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's cabinet. She's been Minister for London, Olympics, Culture Secretary. Uh, on this area, I think it's fair to say she really knows her onions. Please give her a warm welcome. Daisy, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction and uh, thank you uh, to Base Cities for inviting me to uh, speak to you again. Now, I'm really rather uh, reassured that uh, much of what I say is in line with uh, James's uh, contribution that we've, uh, we've just heard, so, uh, so far so good. Um, I'm here to address uh, what challenges might threaten London's uh, resilience now and in the future, and how our great city uh, must adapt and realize these opportunities. So I want to focus on the joint threats of uh, the unaffordability of housing and the high cost of living that, that, uh, that principally uh, that creates and the need for our transport infrastructure uh, to keep pace with the dramatic increase in the size of London's population and the consequent threat to London's place as a global city. And I do think uh, that there is a particular call here on responsible politics which plans for the long term. There are resilience challenges, all these are resilience challenges, uh, with which all of you will be familiar and uh, a lot of uh, today's discussion will focus on. But I'd like uh, to argue that it's London's cultural resilience which will allow our city to adapt to all these changes. But first of all, let me begin with how London has shown resilience throughout the history, because London's past has shaped uh, London now. Our city started as a bridge in AD 47, rapidly became a port, and subsequently a bustling town with citizens um, acr from across the Roman Empire, from the Persian Gulf to our neighbors, the Gauls. And we've incorporated successive waves of migrants since the Jews in the 13th century, the Flemish in the 14th, the Italians in the 15th, the French Huguenots in the 17th. About a quarter of London's population have a Huguenot ancestor. And so on until citizens from our former colonies arrived from the Second World War onwards. So throughout our history, London has been by location uh, and culture blessed with the elements of infrastructure, from the natural infrastructure of our river, which was until recently the main thoroughfare in London, to the cultural legacy of our na na national galleries, 
built with the endowment of Queen Victoria's reign for the enlightenment of the British people, to the physical infrastructure of Sir Joseph Bazalgette's sewers in the 19th century. So London has, over its history, adapted, innovated, and integrated. And that, of course, is what we need to do in order to, maintain, uh, to, to retain uh, London's resilience for the future. So let me just deal uh, briefly, all too briefly, with what I think are the key threats to London's resilience. The first, uh, I've referred to housing and the cost of living. The cost of housing continues to spiral, forcing businesses to relocate, pricing Londoners out of the city, and hampering our ability to respond effectively. And this is a real uh, risk to the uh, awful prospect a, of a further terrorist attack. Businesses are already citing housing costs as why, one of the most pressing concerns for their companies. Uh, over 40% of London Chamber of Commerce members believe that higher housing costs are having a detrimental effect on their ability to recruit and retain staff. Average London house prices grew by 17% in last year alone and now stand at just short of half a million pounds. And yesterday, Shelter, as you will know, published a report which found that only 86 of the homes currently on sale in London are, are genuinely affordable. And we all know that the biggest reason is lack of supply. We'll need 800,000 new homes by 2021, but as of now, we're only building 20,000 a year. The housing crisis isn't just a threat to economic growth or the life chances of Londoners, but it also has the potential uh, to impact on whether London will be able to cope in the instance of major infrastructure failure such as a power outage or terrorist attack. For example, around half of the Met live outside London and many key workers in blue light services inevitably find it difficult to get into the capital in the event of a major incident. It therefore makes sense that housing should be regarded as critical infrastructure and I hope the Mayor will include consideration of housing related pressures when he reviews the London Risk Register. Alongside housing, the cost of living cited by members of London First as one of the main barriers to hiring the workforce that they need. The cost of living in London, uh, to be specific, is 17% higher than in Edinburgh, 23% higher than in Manchester. Housing, more than anything else, accounts for most of that difference. But even excluding housing costs, the cost of living in London is 10% higher than in Edinburgh and 7% higher than in Manchester. So as a result, nearly six out of 10 London-based businesses are experiencing pressure to increase wages simply to enable their employees to meet the higher housing costs that they face. On another a practical issue, a prerequisite to London's economy working properly, sees families moving out of London because of the costs of childcare. I'm uh, chairing a commission uh, for the boroughs of Lambeth and Southwark in which my constituency is in order to address this pressing issue for the residents of those two boroughs, but it is a London-wide challenge. An average of £119 a week per child under two, which is a third higher than anywhere else in the UK. So the cost of living is compounded by the costs of a low-skilled population. 33% of London's workforce not qualified beyond GCSE and 9% having no qualifications at all. 16% of all London's jobs pay less than the London living wage. And in 2012, the unemployment rate in London 
was 31%, similar levels to cities such as Blackpool. So if we fail to ensure a decent supply of affordable housing in both the private and the public sectors, we fail to ensure people's earnings, keep track of costs, and suddenly London may not look the attractive place to live, work, and play after all. So what are the potential policy solutions to this aspect of uh, London, or this challenge to London's resilience? The first, enabling London's local authorities and housing associations to provide more affordable homes by removing the borrowing cap on local authorities' housing revenue accounts. A second, the availability of land uh, within London, um, a point so often made by Richard Rogers, the availability of brownfield sites, um, 3,700 hectares of brownfield land within Greater London, and as many as 210,000 possible homes with unimplemented planning permissions. So London simply cannot function as a city if the people that we need to service our city cannot afford to live here. And as for the cost of living, 750,000 Londoners earn less than the living wage. So by using the power of government procurement, leveraging business buy-in for a living wage, we could bring decent pay and dignity uh, to those workers who pay such a vital role in making sure that the engine of our city works. Very quickly, moving to the second threat, London's transport infrastructure. Our population will grow to 9 million by 2018 and 10 million by 2030. It's predicted there'll be more than uh, 4 million more trips per day by 2023 on London's uh, transport infrastructure. By the end of 2018, Crossrail will add 10% to the network, but London will never see most of its benefits or those uh, from any other uh, current improvements as the extra capacity that this infrastructure uh, provides will be taken up almost immediately by increased demand. For example, although the capacity of the bus network grew by 40% over the last decade, its usage grew by 60%. Network Rail estimates that demand for routes linking central London with the rest of the country will rise by 34% by 2031. Demand will outstrip supply equivalent to almost 40,000 passengers every day being prevented from entering London in the rush hour. So that's uh, one of the many reasons why I support Crossrail 2, a new uh, southwest to northeast rail line beneath the capital, which would add 12% to London's rail transport capacity. And if the line were to be agreed soon, it could be open just before 2030. It's also clear that there's a need for more river crossing in east, the east of London. There are three road crossings east of Tower Bridge compared to 16 crossings at the equivalent distance to the west. And finally, we need to consider new approaches, for example, a step change in cycling provision and unpicking the commuting patterns that see the population of Westminster more than double every weekday. The third threat is that London will lose in the economic race with other global cities and, and growth will be slow if future growth uh, cannot be accommodated uh, both in terms of additional housing and transport capacity and capability. So while London is ranked top of the business capitals of Europe, according to uh, Deloitte's research, its status could quickly be challenged if the delicate reputational uh, balance is undermined. For example, uh, over 40% uh, of companies believe there's not, there are not enough people with high-level specialist skills, and nearly 40% of companies are concerned about the quality of basic education. London has also scored poorly in PwC's uh, good growth 
uh, for Cities Index in 2013 on work-life balance, inequality and unemployment. So London needs to continue to grow, but if, it's, it, but if it is to remain globally competitive, we need to look at good growth. As Bobby Kennedy memorably said, GDP measures everything except that which is worthwhile. Local economic development needs uh, to take account of more holistic measures, understanding the wider impacts that are associated with economic uh, success in our city. Businesses, after all, are looking to locate in a, local, uh, in a global city um, which has good transport links, super fast broadband, um, a tax, uh, attractive uh, tax regime, but of course also they're looking to locate in cities that are good uh, places to live, where their children will go to good schools, where there will be uh, attractive offers for leisure, where they will have future uh, and decent uh, job opportunities. So employee loyalty and productivity depends on all these more holistic uh, factors. So when we consider London's economic resilience, let's not just focus on infrastructure, but also ask whether public services suit the demand of modern life, support work their workers, for example, evening and weekend appointments for working age people, businesses thinking more about increasing opportunities for flexible working, for example, uh, shifting to total hours contracts and arranging local facilities to support work-life balance uh, in uh, creches and uh, gyms. I'd like just to finish with uh, reference to what I describe as London's cultural resilience, and it's what has made London great for centuries. We are an empathetic city, and our greatest moments uh, are invariably described in the relationships that people encounter in the course of that. The spirit of the Blitz, the games makers during the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And as the minister who was responsible for uh, arranging uh, all the kind of support and logistical help for those who were bereaved uh, or who survived the 7-7 bomb attacks, I can tell you that the stories that those families tell and those survivors tell were stories of the relationships they had with the people who were on hand immediately to help or hinder their adaptation to the horror that had befallen them. That is particularly important as we come up to the ninth anniversary of the bombing of London on the 7th of July. But let me just also say this, that the resilience of Londoners and the resilience of London also meant that in the aftermath of the bombing, there was not a single reported attack on a Muslim citizen of London. So London's cultural resilience is one of empathy and humanity, a common thread which runs through so much of London's history and the foundation of what will continue to make our city great. So that takes me back to where I started. London has always been a dynamic centre, open to the world, where its citizens feel uh, connected to each other. And I think it's very important to re to respect and protect our history and the city that we are today, and not to allow somehow the uh, fact that our diversity, our openness, and our tolerance is somehow the enjoyment of an elite. It is the city that we are. The risk to our city is that we become two cities, separated by wealth and the inequality of poverty, both of opportunity and wealth. But there are big challenges in this, um, as the other speakers, uh, Fiona particularly, I think, uh, reflected. 
at so much of these big decisions about London's future and mitigating these risks rely on politicians having the courage, having the shared vision and commitment to London, which enables decisions to be taken for the long term. And so one of the great threats to London is the failure, uh, the potential failure of politics and politicians to step up to that challenge, to plan London and make decisions for the long term, not uh, decisions which are unpicked in the heat of a general uh, or other election campaign. That's a big challenge to all of us of my proud profession. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to Sir David King. Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, and first of all, let me, if I may, congratulate the Lord Mayor, Alderman Fiona Wolfe, on choosing this topic for her year to, to focus on this topic. Absolutely the right topic. Thank you for that, Fiona. Now, I'm, I'm going to, first of all, step back from London and, and take a global view. If we, if we look at the development of humanity across the planet, something is happening in the demographic trend that creates qualitatively new challenges for all of our societies across the planet. It's not population growth, it's the rapid rise in human well-being, which I would measure by the number of middle-class people on the planet's surface people who spend between 10 and $100 a day. One billion in the year 2000, we passed two billion last year, so we've already doubled the number of middle-class consumers. <coughs> and the expectation, and I'm using uh, data from a whole range of economists, the expectation is close to five billion by 2030, just 15 years' time. The good news, five-eighths of the human population will be middle class. The challenge is whether or not our planet can deliver the expectations of the, the global middle class, ourselves included, because we will all be competing for the same commodities and of course, we're all living on the same planet. And so the, the, the dual challenges are one of diminished resources, and in terms of diminished resources, how do we need to challenge that? We need to move away from that linear economy of last century that was so successful, by which I mean we take material goods, we convert them into marketable goods, and then we create waste. We move on to a circular economy in which there is no waste, and waste is seen as a resource, the, the waste of yesterday. And I'm very, very keen to talk to you about human waste, but perhaps I should move on from that. But that is a resource. One percent of human solid waste is nitrates and phosphates. The cost of extracting them would be well covered by the uh, the, the, the cost of them in the marketplace by the, the sale of, of the products in the marketplace. So we, we have to move on from the, the diminished resources to meet the challenges into a new kind of model, a new way of thinking. Every manufactured good should be designed so that it can be recovered and returned to the marketplace when it reaches the end of its time. But secondly, the mismanaged ecosystems, and of course I am representing the Foreign Secretary on climate change in my global travels, and here we're talking about carbon dioxide emissions and the removal of forests being part of the rise of carbon dioxide. But of course the use of fossil fuels is the major part of that process. So we have to move our society into a close to zero carbon dioxide society. The British government has decided that we will reduce our emissions by 80% compared with 1990 by 2050. And we have a climate change office that is keeping us on track. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say the, the first period, 2008 to 2012, we, we have actually passed 
the carbon budget that we were given. And so we are on track to a very substantial reduction as we move forward. But that will require all of us to focus on that, all of us, particularly in situations of responsibility. Let me just say it's not just global warming, ocean acidification is a parallel process occurring. 72% of the Earth's surface is oceans. As the sea level rises, that percentage may go up. Um, but the, the acidification of the oceans is actually potentially going to destroy much of marine life. So we, we're, we're looking at situations where not only do we have a commodity challenge, but we also have a massive ecosystem challenge. So when we're busy talking about future-proofing, and I'm delighted that all the speakers have chosen to focus on that, Fiona, Gerard, Tessa, all looking at future-proofing, this long-range view becomes absolutely essential as we move forward in time. Now, Future Cities Catapult is uh, uh, the uh, brainchild of the Technology Strategy Board. I'm chairing this body, so let me just tell you what our ambition is, what we plan to be doing. So first of all, we are just over a year old in terms of my own appointment, but then, of course, chief executive had to be appointed. So we're, we're a very young organization still. But after I was appointed, I first of all traveled to many major cities in the world to find out whether what we were planning to do had a unique place in what is a very busy environment of uh, uh, developing uh, resilience through future cities' knowledge networks. And I'm convinced that what we're doing, we're planning to create a global hub that I will describe, is unique worldwide. And it became very, very clear to me as I traveled around, and often people said to me, whether in New York or Washington or Delhi, that London was the ideal place to set up a global hub of this kind to establish future cities uh, uh, in, in the way we plan. Why is London ideal? Well, you've, you've heard all of the good reasons why London is an exemplar. Let me also add a peculiar one, if you like. Our city is a, is a medieval city. It's very easy to remind you of that in this particular hall. And I believe that medieval cities are actually the design model for 21st century and 22nd century cities. Now, why do I say that? The cities of Europe, the medieval cities, were designed before the arrival of the car, the automobile. These cities were designed for people to walk about. Not many people had horses and carriages at their disposal. These are cities with mixed facilities within walking distance of many, many of their citizens. And walkability, and I add now, not from medieval times, cyclability, is a big part of delivering human well-being as we move forward in time. So as a model city for new urban developments around the world, this becomes critical. Now let me go back, that rising middle class, new urban developments around the world. By 2050, there will be an additional 3.3 billion urban dwellers in the Asia Pacific region and 1.3 billion ur additional urban dwellers in Africa. There is the challenge, but it is also the opportunity. And it's an opportunity that can be addressed through the capabilities that you've heard about that we have here in London. I, I believe that as we move forward in time, the, the architects, the engineers, the urban development planners, the, the building cap capabilities, resilient buildings, low carbon buildings, um, the financial sector, of course, a great strength, and the academic expertise that we have in the city can be rolled out for the benefit of a bigger part of the world. Not that we can go about the business of redesigning and designing cities for the whole world, but that we can set exemplar cities going 
that we can work with other cities. Now, I can tell you the Future Cities Catapult is now on the agenda for many, many cities around the world. And we're going to have to be very selective. Is it going to be Rio? Is it going to be Mexico City? There, is, there are mayors lining up to say, come along, bring British expertise and help us. And perhaps even I should mention in, in China, where new cities are emerging at, uh, at quite a remarkable rate, there is an offer for us to step in with all of the British expertise based here in London to develop a new city in China, a low carbon, resilient, sustainable city. So we have based ourselves in London. Uh, we are a physical entity. We are not uh, an imaginary entity. Uh, we have uh, acquired a building in Clerkenwell. It's a large building. Uh, we have a chief executive officer, Peter Madden. We have five executive directors appointed over the last six months. And we're now up to a staff level of 50. Um, I believe within about 12 months, we should be at about 100. This is providing us with the capacity to deliver. But what we're delivering, let me emphasize, is particularly networking capability. So what, what we're creating here in London is a mechanism, a global hub, where we can pull together expertise and then use that expertise uh, in many different parts of the world. Now, what are we doing as we set ourselves up? Well, under the banner of livability, sustainability, low carbon, we're focusing on three things in our initial development. The first is on developing prototypes, so identifying, supporting, and improving ideas for new urban products um, and services. These are products and services with commercial applications such as new city navigation technology. Secondly, proving through data modeling. So collecting in our city's lab big data from companies and also from city service providers such as Transport for London, but also rich data, that is data from ethnographic studies, demographic data, uh, data from citizen input, this collection of data, then put into our modeling capability. We bring together into this master planners, anthropologists, future specialists, um, and with that capacity, we can then test city development at scale. We can model a given city and then test future developments at scale. It also has a visual uh, capability so that we can easily visualize what impacts changes will make over the coming period. And we're, we're looking out into the future, not next year, but 10 years, 20 years, 50 years hence, so that we are able to future-proof cities as we move forward. And then finally, scaling, and a topic that uh, Fiona knows more about than most. We help deploy new products and services in major infrastructure projects. So we're working to identify barriers to their uptake and help access finance to bring cutting-edge solutions to the market. So the bottom line is we're, we're creating a global hub and an urban laboratory. Uh, the creation of this uh, hub is such that we will create a space, we, we will create a magnet through our own staff, but we'll create a space where we will invite people from London, but people from around the world to come and spend time with us, months uh, or even years, so that we are working with best practice as it's developed around the world, bringing it all into one place and sharing best practice as we go forward. Uh, so just to summarize, we're assembling policymakers, uh, private sector players, uh, we're uh, uh, bringing together academics and financiers. We're, the idea is to assist in the creation of future-proofed cities um, uh, focused on the well-being of the citizens of those cities, first and foremost. Contributing to the challenges of poverty eradication, inclusiveness, human capital development, 
um, all, all of those things, natural resource depletion high on our agenda, that issue of waste, and ecosystem protection in the face of these increased challenges that, uh, that are ahead of us. And then finally, collaborating on new mechanisms. So we're, we're a new facility here in London. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce you to what we are building up to do. And I know my chief executive is nervous if I don't use this phrase, building up to do. We're not quite there yet, but we are developing. We're in a very rapid phase of development now. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.